Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this 35th episode of the Clements Bookworm. Um, I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development, and happy to host you today. Today's meeting is being recorded to share online later. And this afternoon, you will receive an email with the recording and any resources mentioned in today's broadcast. Just a quick tutorial in case you're joining us for the first time. We do enjoy having you chime in in the chat. Oh, we need to update our slide because I think they've changed the wording, but whatever wording seems to encompass the most people, choose that. Um, we also, though, find that the chat goes by very quickly. So if you do have questions for our panelists, please put that in the Q&A section. You can also hit the little thumbs up if you see a question that someone else is asking that also interests you. That will upvote the question and reorder it so that it's higher in the queue. We have our live transcription turned on today. Uh, as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program. If you would like to toggle that on or off, you can go to that button and you can also change the size there. I can only control so much of what you see, but we do have side-by-side -side mode enabled. So you should be able to change the relative size of the slides and the speaker uh, by moving the separator. My colleague Tracy Paovich is monitoring the chat and we'll be putting helpful links in there throughout the program. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. As a descendant of the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan was funded by and founded on Anishinaabe lands seated in coercive historical treaties through the dispossession of indigenous peoples, most notably through the 1817 Treaty of Fort Meigs. The William L. Clements Library acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. To learn more about the indigenous people whose land you occupy, please check out the website for Native Land Digital. I know that we still have people signing on this morning, but if you can click quickly on our poll, that would be wonderful. Um, since we'll be talking about maps today, we thought we'd see how you all have used um, hand-drawn maps in the past. I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and share the results. So it looks like uh, many people have uh, experienced drawing maps when learning geography in school, and of course, to give people directions. Um, it's, it's uh, I see there's a couple of people who have other in there. And if you haven't yet uh, shared what how you've used them, it would be fun, fun for you to do so in the chat. Today's episode is generously sponsored by Tom Root in celebration of Corey Root's birthday. Tom, thank you so much for being a part of the bookworm um, community and for sponsoring today's episode. I'm happy to welcome two past fellows to talk about their research today. 2014 Price Fellow, Chet Van Duzer, and 2020-2021 Mary G. Stang Fellow, Danny Sporover. 
I'm delighted for you both to share how you have used the hack atlases. Chet Van Duzer is an author and cartographic historian. He is also a founding member of the Lazarus Project at the University of Rochester, which brings multispectral imaging to cultural institutions around the world. He has published extensively on medieval and Renaissance maps. His recent books include Enriquez Martellus's World Map at Yale, circa 1491, Multispectral Imaging, Sources, and Influence, as well as Martin Baldzi Mueller's Carta Marina of 1516, Study and Transcription of the Long Legends. His current project is a book about cartographic cartouches. We also have with us today Danny Sporover, who is a historical archaeologist specializing in the interdisciplinary study of literate societies. Sporover is a co-director and instructor in several research projects and field schools in Mexico and Peru. In addition, he conducted archaeological, historical, and ethnographic research in Canada, Ecuador, and Israel. His current research interests include colonialism, territoriality, mobility, social memory, and pirates. Danny is, uh, is co-director of a vol co-editor, I apologize, of a volume of work that bridges the gap between archaeology and history of the pre-Columbian, colonial, and republican eras of the state of Oaxaca, Mexico a cultural area encompassing several of the longest enduring literate societies in the world. Danny also recently wrote about his research in the Clements Library Chronicles, Pirates and Indigenous of the Pacific, reading between the coastlines of the Hack Atlas. Thank you both so much for being here today. So I think in order to set the stage, we probably need to know a little bit more about what these hack atlases are and who exactly is William Hack. Chet, you wanna go? Sure, so we're, we're seeing a few images of the hack atlas uh, at the Clements Library. Uh, which is worth emphasizing is, is a spectacular volume uh, there. So it's a, uh, a program of hand-painted maps that cover the Western coasts of the New World from Mexico to the Southern tip of South America. Uh, and as we'll see as the slides proceed, uh, they're beautifully hand-painted and the volume, is, it's, a, it's a very large volume. So uh, it's, it's visually very impressive. So here we see some images that give the, the scale of the volume. And unfortunately, we know very little about Hack himself. Uh, as I'll mention later, uh, he was by far the most productive member of the so-called Thames School of Cartography, which was uh, operating in London. Um, but we have almost nothing in the way of biographical details. There's no surviving portrait. Um, he did publish, uh, most of his maps are manuscript, but he, he did uh, edit a, a book, uh, a collection of uh, of narrations of voyages. Um, but unfortunately, again, we, we know very little about the man himself. Yeah, and, and I can add that uh, the um, hack was actually uh, initially copied from um, uh, an earlier volume, a Spanish volume called the uh, Derrotero del Mar del Sur or Derrotero General del Mar del Sur that was captured uh, of the coast of Ecuador in 1681 uh, by the English and brought to London. And that's when Hack started uh, producing or copying that volume. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit in my presentation as well, but obviously that was a big uh, 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 treasure for uh, the cartographic knowledge of, of the English. 
there is in fact another um, great uh, blog that was written um, about uh, about that in uh, in the Clements Chronicles, and uh, Hack produced uh, about fourteen. Uh, editions, I'd like to call them editions rather than copies, because as we will see, each one of them is unique and different and they're added information for each. So that's why it's important to actually look at, look at them as a corpus rather than just uh, look at one and, and think that you looked at the hack atlas. You actually have to compare and contrast between them. Thank you, thanks. Um, well, I'm excited for you to share how you've both used uh, these atlases in your research project. So, uh, Chet, will you start us off by telling us more? Sure, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And make it larger. There we go. So Danny mentioned that uh, all of the hack atlases are different, and that's uh, precisely what I'll be talking about today is di some differences, some very intriguing differences in the different atlases made by William Hack, and specifically the differences that relate to the indications of shipwrecks and treasure. And since I'll be talking about the possibility of recovering things, from shipwrecks. Uh, I'll begin by showing some images of early equipment and methods for salvaging shipwrecks. And by early, I mean 16th and 17th century. I think normally when we think about recovering material from shipwrecks, we think about the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. But uh, it's, it's essential for what I'll say later to know that uh, recovery of material from shipwrecks was indeed possible and was indeed done in the 16th and 17th centuries. So I'll begin with this image from a book published in 1550 by uh, Girolamo Cardano, his book De Subtilitate. And in this, uh, we'll zoom in on the illustration here which is a method for raising a sunken ship using the buoyant force of five other ships. And the text says, when ships sink in a channel and there is a plan to pull them up, skiffs laden with rocks are tied to the vessel with ropes by divers in such a way that the ropes are as taut as possible. Then rocks extracted from these skiffs are unloaded into a similar number of empty skiffs with the result that the skiffs that are emptied out pull the vessel up gradually from the depths along with themselves. So a method for raising a ship from the bottom of the sea. Um, here we have an illustration from Diego Ufano's book about artillery published in 1621. And uh, there's a section, how to raise a sunken ship with its artillery and everything in the water. So, one might ask why a book about artillery has a section about how to raise a sunken ship. Well, the, the cannon then, that went down with a ship were extremely valuable. So any complete discussion of artillery would uh, include a uh, discussion of how to recover these incredibly valuable weapons from a sunken ship. And we can see that the method that Ufano is pro proposing here is very similar to uh, what we saw in Cardano's book, that is, one uses the buoyant force of intact ships to raise uh, the sunken vessel. And here we have a fantastic illustration from Ufano's book about the, the process of recovering a cannon from a sunken ship. So we can see that the diver has a primitive breathing apparatus and that he is uh, attaching hooks to the cannon. And then this, the scale is a little bit strange in this illustration, but on the ships, there's a, a mechanism that will enable uh, the easy raising uh, of the heavy cannon from the bottom. Now we'll see a few illustrations from a fantastic manuscript, which is in the Naval Museum in Madrid by Pedro de Ledesma which is about uh, fishing for pearls and seeking sunken galleons. Uh, and we see here, uh, there's a, a sh sunken ship here and a diver going down to the ship. 
And the accompanying text says that this illustrates another way and safe invention for one or two or more people to go down to the bottom of the sea where there are 96 to 150 feet of water and be there three and four hours. So these are impressive numbers for the early 17th century. And uh, another illustration in the book about uh, recovering material from shipwrecks, another way and artifice, uh, another way of artifice and instrument to know the bottom of the sea after being moored and seizing whatever ship or galleon is there. So we have divers fixing anchors to the sunken ship and then a machine for raising the ship. Uh, and here we have an illustration from George Sinclair's book, The Hydrostatics from 1672. So uh, just about, just, just before Hack started making his atlases. And this illustrates a diving bell that Sinclair had actually experimented with. Uh, he used a lead diving bell in Tobermory Bay on the Isle of Mull in 1664 to recover cannons from a shipwreck uh, from the Spanish Armada. So again, just a few illustrations to show that the recovery of material from shipwrecks was something that was not just possible, but that was done uh, in the 16th and particularly the 17th centuries. So moving on to the atlases of William Hack, who flourished from 1671 to 1702. Uh, again, we have very few biographical details about him, no surviving portrait. He made these wonderfully elaborate and beautiful manuscript charts. And as I said earlier, was the most productive member of the so-called Thames School of Cartography. And he edited a collection of original voyages in 1699. So although most of his works are hand-painted uh, manuscripts, uh, he did have some entry into the world of print. Uh, this is the index map of Hax Atlas from 1685, which is in the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. So the index map shows the area covered by all the uh, individual local maps in the atlas. And so it goes from a little bit north of Acapulco in Mexico all the way to the Strait of Magellan. And we've already seen a few uh, maps from the Clements Library uh, copy of the Hack Atlas, but I'll just show a few more. I want to emphasize that these are very, very detailed maps of the western coast of the New World with, it's important to emphasize, a lot of textual description and details about the resources that were available at each point on the coast, at each town, at each port, and the, the, the people who lived there, details about them as well. And so here's an image from the Hack Atlas at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Again, we see the elaborate textual notes in addition to the detailed graphic image of the coastline. And here's an opening from the Clements Hack Atlas from 1698. So we'll now look at the indications of shipwrecks and treasure in the atlases of William Hack. And what we're going to see is that some of the maps, all of his maps indicate the locations of shipwrecks, but some also indicate the treasure that was on board those ships when they went down. So we'll look at several Hack maps of the same regions. And we'll start with uh, Garachine in Panama. So here is the map of that region in Hack's Atlas of 1683 in the Free Library of Philadelphia. And we see here a text that says, on this shoal, the Almirant of the King of Spain was lost in the year 1631. So information about a shipwreck. Uh, Hack's Atlas of 1685 in Greenwich, the map of the same region. We can see the maps are very similar. And here we have basically the same text. On this shoal was lost the Almirante of the King of Spain in the year 1631. 
Here we have the Hack Atlas at the John Carter Brown Library from 1698 or so. And here the text is a bit different. On this shoal was lost the Almirante of the King of Spain in the year 1631. In her was a vast treasure. So as, as Danny mentioned uh, in the preliminaries, uh, there are differences between the Hack Atlases and this is a very interesting difference. The other two make no mention of treasure, but the JCB Atlas does. Looking at the Clements Library Atlas, <clears throat> map of same region, and the text says, on this shoal was lost the Almirante of the King of Spain in the year 1631, in which was abundance of treasure. So again, uh, that additional information about the treasure. Looking at the Bancroft Library Hack Atlas, a map of the same region, the text here says, on this bank, the Almirante of the King of Spain was lost in the year 1631. The ship was lost in her voyage from Panama to Lima, and in her was a great treasure. And then he, the, the scribe corrects himself and says, I mean, from Lima to Panama in terms of the direction of the voyage. But again, that additional information about the treasure. Looking at another group of maps, uh, this time of Colanche in Ecuador. <clears throat> this is the Atlas again in the Free Library of Philadelphia. And here there's no mention of a shipwreck for whatever reason. The Clements Library Atlas, the map of the same region, says the rock of Colanche on which was cast away in, anno, in the year 1644, a vast rich ship designed for England to relieve King Charles I, which is a very interesting detail, uh, which I don't have time to pursue today. But the specification that the ship is rich is, is important for our purposes. The Atlas in the John Carter Brown Library, <clears throat> zooming in here, the text says, the rock of Calanche on which was cast away in the year 1644, a very rich ship having many millions of money on board and several copper guns. So now it's not just the mention of the fact that there was treasure on the ship or much treasure on the ship, but an indication of the quantity of treasure on board. And looking at the Huntington Library, Hack Atlas, the map of the same region, <clears throat> Here it says, the Rock of Colanche, on which was cast away in the year 1644, a very rich ship, having many millions of money on board and several copper guns. So again, details about the treasure that was on the ship. And moving to the Bancroft Library uh, manuscript, the Rock of Colanche. Here the text is up above, and it says, on this rock was cast away in the year 1644, a very rich ship, having then on board 150,000 pieces of eight and 70 pieces of brass ordnance, and it lies in about seven fathoms or 42 feet of water. We have even more detailed information here about the amount of treasure on the ship. So what is the pattern? Why is it that some of the atlases uh, mention shipwrecks but not treasure, and then others do include information about treasure. Well, the pattern is that the earlier atlases do not include references to treasure, and the later ones do. What could have caused this change? I suggest that the change was caused by uh, a spectacular recovery of treasure from a Spanish wreck in the Caribbean by William Phipps in 1687. So I'll suggest that this recovery of treasure by Phipps was what inspired Hack to add information about treasure to his atlases. So here's a portrait of Phipps. Uh, he was of humble birth in Maine. He became a ship captain and became famous precisely for recovering treasure from a Spanish wreck in the Caribbean in 1687 and was later appointed governor of Massachusetts Bay, the Massachusetts Bay colony in 1691. This is a portrait of Christopher Monk, second Duke of Albemarle, who has been described as a man of little ability or character. Uh, nonetheless, from 1682, he was Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, and from 1687, Governor of Jamaica. And it was Albemarle who funded Phipps' voyage to the Caribbean, 
1686 to recover treasure from a Spanish shipwreck. And thanks to Phipps success, Albemarle became the most successful treasure seeker in English history. And what that means is that in terms of the amount of money spent uh, versus the amount of treasure recovered, that case uh, for that ratio for Albemarle is the best in the history of, of England. So it's uh, quite an accomplishment. And when Phipps returned to London with this treasure, it caused a sensation. So this is a new sheet announcing Phipps' recovery of the treasure. And if we, uh, the, the title is An Exact and Perfect Relation of the Arrival of the Ship, the James and Mary, Captain Phipps' Commander, with 200,000 pounds in gold and silver taken up in nine fathom, 54 feet of water from the bottom of the sea, being a supposed wreck of a Spanish galleon cast away about 43 years ago among the Bahama Islands. And on the reverse of the sheet, it says, but Albemarle left order that none go ashore till she, the ship, is unladen of her cargo, being actually 26 tons and 700 pounds weight of silver, 15 tons thereof being pieces of eight, two bars or ingots of gold, 17 pounds weight, six brass cannon of 30 hundred weight each, being as serviceable as at first, meaning that it would still be possible to fire the cannons, which amount in the whole to above 200,000 uh, pounds. And this recovery didn't just inspire this broadsheet, it also inspired the, uh, the minting of medals, commemorative medals such as this one, which has Albemarle's portrait uh, and uh, the motto, from the sea comes everything. We, we see two ships in the background there. And then this medal with the portraits of James II and Mary. And on the reverse, the motto, always let your hook hang down. <clears throat> and uh, an indication that this memo, medal commemorates the recovery of a shipwreck. And in the foreground, we can see a little illustration of a boat uh, trying to recover things from a shipwreck. So uh, this Phipps recovery, again, caused a sensation in London. So it seems likely that the news of Phipps' success inspired Hack to add information about treasure to his maps, but how can we be sure well, in fact, Albemarle was one of Hack's early patrons and Hack dedicated one of his atlases to him. So this is uh, a Hack manuscript in the British Library, Sloan Manuscript 47. And we have Albemarle's coat of arms as the person to whom uh, Hack is dedicating the atlas. And we have the, the textual dedication below to his grace, Christopher Duke of Albemarle uh, from William Hack. So Hack was in certainly in contact with Albemarle. He, he would have found out about, uh, if he hadn't found out, as everyone else in London found out about uh, the shipwreck and Phipps' recovery of it, he certainly would have found out from Albemarle. But moreover, we know that Hack was very well informed about Phipps' recovery of the treasure because he made a map showing the location of the Spanish wreck in 1687, the same year Phipps returned to London. So there can really be not the slight, there can be not the slightest doubt that Hack knew about Phipps' spectacular success. So here is that map titled A Description of the Bahama Banks, originally taken by Mr. Charles Salmon under the command of Captain Phipps. So Hack had information, and in this case, a map from people who had participated in the expedition. And here we have an indication of the location of the plate rack, meaning the Spanish rack with lots of silver. And here we have uh, a helpful indication. Here there is good roading or anchorage and smooth water when you are forced from the wreck by a strong northwest wind. So it seems that inspired by Phipps' recovery of this treasure, Hack repurposed or additionally purposed his atlases as guides for the recovery of treasure from Spanish wrecks. And in at least one contemporary case, one of his atlases was accorded a much higher valuation because of this new purpose, that is this new function of his atlases as guides to treasure and the resultant increase in value was quickly recognized. 
So here we have a portrait of Nicholas Whitson, who was a statesman and uh, mayor of Amsterdam a few different times and an administrator of the Dutch East India Company or VOC and a cartographer and expert on Russia. And Whitson owned the Hack Atlas that is now in the Bancroft Library and tipped this letter into the manuscript, which I'll now uh, read. And be, but before I do so, it's important to emphasize that the Bancroft Library Atlas is one of the ones that includes indications of the locations of treasure. And Woodson writes, I collected between two or 300 maps of which as far as I know, nobody had duplicates. All were drawn very preciously and one could clearly see many places in the South Sea, that is in the Pacific, where ships were sunk, loaded with silver and gold, which would be easy to recover and up till now have been neglected by the Spaniards. Those maps had cost me around 3000 guilders estimated. This paper treasure, which was estimated at 20 or 30,000 guilders, I had offered to the court of Madrid and sold for 10,000 guilders and a present worthy of a king. So that is to say the price he had agreed upon was 10,000 guilders plus a gift from the king. That is why well, they were deposited, the maps, and sealed at his majesty's ambassador in the Hague until the money and the present, which I hoped would surpass the treasure in value, would be received. But the ambassador sent the work without my knowledge overseas to Spain. The ship was hijacked and these maps were thrown into the sea. For me, having only a few copies left, I could get no higher payment than 8,000 guilders. So he wrote this in 1692. So Whitson valued the atlas at 20 to 30,000 guilders and had arranged to get approximately that amount, so 10,000 guilders plus a gift that he hoped would equal or surpass 10,000 guilders in value from the Spanish court. And he later sold some of the maps that he had copied from the atlas for 8,000 guilders. For comparison, the Huntington manuscript, uh, the Huntington hack atlas has tipped into it a letter from William Hill of the South Sea Company dated December 3rd, 1711, in which he says that in 1693, he had bought the atlas directly from William Hack for 70 pounds, which is the equivalent of 778 guilders at the time. So one of Hack's atlases was worth about 25 times as much when it was marketed as a guide to finding shipwrecks and treasures as it was when it was sold as a beautiful and detailed guide to sailing the Western coasts of the Americas. So to conclude, it's interesting that the, the information about treasure on shipwrecks is a very small percentage of the information in Hack's atlases, but represents a really remarkable repurposing or additional purposing of the atlases, vastly increasing their potential value. And it's amazing that all, at almost the same time that Hack himself, who should have appreciated their value better than anyone, sold one of his atlases that contains information about treasure for the equivalent of 778 guilders, Whitson was negotiating to sell another of his atlases for 20,000 guilders or about 25 times more. So Whitson saw the information about treasure in the Hack Atlas, immediately understood its value and found a buyer who understood it too, namely the King of Spain, to whom the treasure in the ships had originally belonged. Whitson understood the value of and market for Hack's revised work much better than Hack himself did. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks. I, I assume I, I should go next. Let me share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> I hope you can all see that. Yes. <clears throat> okay, great, thank you. So um, my um, research area um, is focused mostly on uh, Southern, the Pacific coast of Mexico, um, but uh, it's obviously uh, belonged to 
a larger area that was uh, very dynamic uh, between the 16th and uh, 18th century, even the early 19th century, um, where uh, we can really consider this um, in a way as the birth of globalization in, in the early 16th century. Um, and especially uh, when um, you consider the uh, connection between uh, the Pacific coast uh, that will be the focus of, that is the focus of my research and the Atlantic coast um, and the Caribbean sea that uh, connected to uh, Europe. And uh, early on in the 16th century, uh, the Spanish realized um, or made incursion into this area of Oaxaca, which is today the state of Oaxaca in Mexico. Um, and establish uh, two important coasts. In a minute, uh, we'll have a zoom uh, of this region. Uh, one of the most important uh, ports uh, at, uh, uh, in the early 16th century was Huatulco. And later on, most of the uh, transport on the Pacific uh, moved to Acapulco with the famous uh, Manila galleons or Manila Acapulco galleons that again operated up until the um, ninth, early 19th century, 1815, I, I believe was the last ship. So again, this was a very dynamic uh, uh, area um, in uh, uh, starting in the, in the early colonial period. And today I will be focusing specifically on one uh, indigenous group uh, in the state of Oaxaca, uh, the Chontal people, uh, and uh, one of their main town is Guamelula. This is a drone shot of Guamelula as it looks today. And you can see here in that inset map that Guamelula uh, is actually located in between two of the most important early ports uh, on the Pacific. They start as indigenous ports, but again, later on turn into uh, Spanish ports that connected South America and uh, uh, um, Asia, and again, through Veracruz, uh, connected to Europe. So <clears throat> the Chantal people, uh, although it's a rather uh, small indigenous group compared to others, um, were actually located in, in a hub of, of interactions and exchange and, and um, uh, maritime trade in uh, the uh, 16th and 17th century. And this is basically the uh, extent of the Chantal uh, ethnic group uh, locations or villages today. <clears throat> now, um, for about the last five or six years, uh, we have been returning uh, with collaborators and students uh, to the town of San Pedro Amelula to document their festivity. It's about a week long festivity uh, where uh, the Chuntal people take on different uh, uh, groups, characters, and reenacts uh, what, according to them, are historical events and processes in the history of their uh, community. <clears throat> um, and um, this, this takes place during the uh, last week of June and culminating um, on uh, June uh, 29th and 30th uh, and San Pedro Day. Um, and one of the groups um, are, um, sorry, are those weird looking characters, uh, which they call uh, Lampichilinkis, which is actually a Chontal term, uh, which is a loan from the Spanish term Pechelinges, which is another uh, loan word de derived most likely from the port of Lissingen or Flushing in the Netherlands, where um, traders or what the Spanish would have defined as pir pirates uh, sailed from. So um, these, uh, these characters, as you can see, they wear these kind of uh, um, fair skin looking masks and all kinds of uh, very uh, elaborate costumes. Um, these are understood by the Chantal people today to be uh, the pirates, the pirates that arrive from the sea. And, um, and uh, this is uh, their reenact, the reenactment or uh, uh, a recreation of, the, of that pirate ship that arrived to the community from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, as you can see, it's a ox cart that they uh, repurpose. Uh, they uh, hang uh, mats and all kinds of 
uh, <clears throat> weavings, and I'll talk about these in a minute. And uh, there are a lot of episodes and, and the, uh, theatrical scenes involving uh, those uh, pirates. I should mention that the festivity is very complex. The, the Pechelingas or the pirates are only one group uh, in this week long uh, theatrical reenactment, um, but every day they go out and uh, you know they, they do things. And one of the uh, main themes in this festivity is the conflicts between the Pechelingas, the pirates, and what the Chontal call Los Negros, the black ones. And as you can see, this group, they wear black, black masks and black uh, clothes, and they carry this uh, uh, curious looking uh, idol, which um, I won't go into uh, at the moment. Um, but um, these are understood uh, as another group that arrived from the Pacific into the community and are uh, fighting with the Pechelingas. This is a shot of one of those conflicts uh, uh, on both sides of a tight rope that they uh, uh, tie al along the street and they fight there. And the story, uh, after several uh, days of fighting, the story is that the, this, what they call La Muralla, the defensive wall collapses and the, span the pirates, sorry, uh, storm uh, the town and basically capture the uh, colonial church. And I'll show you in a minute a video of what it looks like. Um, another uh, interesting episode is that the pirates actually capture um, the, 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 the black ones, the Los Negros, uh, they capture them and then they take them back to their ship and hang them upside down on the mask, on the mast of, of uh, that improvised uh, ship, and you can see that scene over here on the left. And um, in fact, um, if you compare that to 17th, 18th century description of punishments of enslaved Africans on English ships, that was exactly uh, what, uh, what they did. Uh, so again, this is uh, kind of brings in mind uh, the idea that uh, what we're looking at is our encoded interactions between uh, or, or, or some sort of uh, uh, conflicts between pirates and enslaved uh, people, most likely enslaved Africans on board those ships. Uh, this is a, a video, I, I hope you can uh, see it, um, of the pirates actually arriving to uh, the town um, and so-called attacking this uh, colonial church. As you can see, it's a very ritualized attack. It's actually a dance. Um, and this is how they actually um, end the festivity by claiming uh, the colonial church and, and consider Wamelula as being conquered by the pirates. So that got me uh, very interested in those entanglements or uh, complex interactions between the indigenous people uh, on the Pacific coast and pirates and the enslaved uh, Africans. And uh, much of the literature that, that deals with indigenous people for the one hand is concerned mostly with their interaction with the Spanish uh, empire, the Spanish overlords naturally, um, not so much with other uh, maritime empires that arrived to the coast of the Pacific. Um, and hardly uh, with their interaction with the slave, uh, enslaved Africans. On the other hand, uh, the literature on pirates um, is uh, at least traditionally has been focused on conflicting um, European maritime nations that are uh, competing over uh, uh, power and trade in American waters and not so much as they as the indigenous or enslaved Africans were actually part of these entanglements. So again, that, that kind of got us interested. Um, obviously, uh, we do know about some of these entanglements in the Caribbean, uh, you know, the famous uh, pirates of the Caribbean, English pirates and Johnny Depp, but not so much on the Pacific. Uh, what we do know is that those uh, <clears throat> English pirates that arrived in the Pacific, um, again, we're, we're very much uh, interested in 
documenting uh, and understanding better that part of, of, uh, of the coast uh, because the Spanish had um, uh, almost an exclusive hold on the Pacific Ocean uh, at the time, both on the America, in the Americas and in Asia. And um, the English were trying to insert themselves uh, into that uh, uh, exclusive control and, and uh, either uh, uh, get their own uh, uh, control or information or trade um, into it. So one of the uh, areas that they focused on was exactly the port of uh, Watulco that I mentioned earlier, um, close to Amilula on the Pacific uh, coast. Um, two of the most uh, notorious uh, English pirates that arrived to Watulco uh, were Francis Drake in 1579 and Thomas Cavendish about a few years later. Um, they uh, looted the port of Watulco. Um, as Thomas Cavendish is also known to have tried to burn uh, a large cross that was placed there on the coast. Um, in fact, uh, the legends say that it wasn't a, a Catholic or a Spanish cross. In fact, it was an indigenous one that was placed there even before the Spanish arrived. So again, that's an interesting uh, um, detail, but uh, we really don't know much about the historicity of, uh, of this event. Uh, but they were not the only one. There are other uh, English captains and their crews that arrived um, and, and either attack the uh, Pacific coast between Huatulco and Tehuantepec um, or just documented or interacted in other ways, as I'll discuss in a second. Um, and there are other um, uh, non-Spanish uh, um, captains like uh, Spielbergen, Van Spielbergen, a Dutch, and Pierre Lapicard, which I'll mention later on, uh, who is French. So this is uh, where the uh, hack, the Clements Hack Atlas comes into play, um, since um, it's uh, not only describing the coast, as uh, Chet uh, just showed us, it's also one of the latest uh, editions that Hack produced in 1698. Um, so um, as the, that beautifully illustrated uh, title play, uh, page demonstrates uh, or, or declare, it's from the original Spanish manuscript that was captured in 1681 and our late English discoveries. So it had that added, added information. Um, so it was very interesting um, to compare uh, the Hack Atlas to the original uh, this is the Derotero uh, General del Mal de Sur, the Spanish original um, from 1669. Uh, this is the uh, Huntington uh, edition and there are others uh, around the world. And um, when, when I went through the pages, um, there are some interesting um, notes, quick notes about uh, uh, Drake and Cavendish. Um, but they, they don't really uh, discuss these very important English uh, um, sailors or, or uh, explorers of the Pacific. In fact, uh, there, uh, a lot of these pages are actually dedicated to describe the indigenous people um, of, uh, of the, the Pacific coast. Uh, this is, for, for example, from Sardinas Bay, which I believe is between uh, Colombia and Ecuador today. Um, and they describe uh, the indigenous people in this case as Indian warriors and they describe their uh, um, uh, fighting techniques and their canoes um, and things like that, which obviously are of interest to those uh, English pirates um, as they were engaging with these indigenous people. And obviously they're interested uh, in, in that information to actually establish whether these indigenous people uh, could be, uh, are, are there foes, are, are they hostile? Would they be hostile to them? Or maybe they're allies. As the old saying go, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Maybe if they're uh, also hostile to the Spanish, they could be uh, friendly to the English. Uh, one of these, these instance, instances is in, uh, in the, these pages of the Clemens Hack uh, from uh, Golfo Dulce, which is today in Costa Rica. Uh, which the English actually renamed King Charles Harbor. And they tell us um, 
by the Spanish, this is called Golfe Dulce or Sweet Golf, but Captain Bartholomew Sharp um, came, and the, uh, Sharp was in, in that voyage that actually captured uh, the original Terrotero, came hither in the year 1680 to uh, careen his ship, found the Indian so extraordinarily kind and just in trading with him and coming on board this ship with provision and permitting him to erect tent on shore. Um, let me just, um, can see the, the bottom here, but uh, basically um, he's saying that they allow him to settle on, on these shores. And you can see again that uh, the uh, uh, you know, British flag, English flag there uh, flapping in the wind. And this is obviously is not uh, a detail that you can find in the Spanish uh, derrotero. In fact, that, that line that the, the indigenous people allow him to settle on, on this coast uh, I don't think anyone ever identified any English settlement in, in Costa Rica in, in, for the uh, uh, 1680s, but um, the, uh, that line is, is unique also to the Clements as far as, the, as I could uh, find in, in other hack, um, which means again, that maybe the patron of this particular edition uh, was interested in that information. Um, and so going back to the port of Huatulco, um, Another interesting detail uh, when you compare between the hack and the derrotero is that uh, the hack atlas says this port of Huatulco um, is Embarcadero to the south part of Mexico in the South Seas of America, and it is very wealthy and place of great trade. Um, now the, the derrotero, the Spanish derrotero does not say anything about this being a very wealthy and, and place of great trade because in fact, by this time, uh, the late uh, uh, 1600s, the, most of the Spanish trade had moved to Acapulco, again, either through uh, the Manila Galleon that connected Philippines and China to uh, the Americas and, and then to Europe, uh, but also to South America. So um, at this time, at least for the Spanish, uh, Huatulco wasn't so uh, such an important port, but um, uh, we uh, think maybe that um, the English uh, were able to trade with the indigenous people that still lived in the port. Uh, it was mostly controlled by indigenous people. There are hardly any Spanish living there. Um, and um, in fact, this is the uh, page that talks about Acapulco in the hack. Um, and the hack only says the Spaniards have great uh, trade to China, et cetera, from Acapulco. So again, this is you know, uh, um, a very uh, laconic way to talk about this great Manila galleon that operated for 250 years while they're actually taking, talking about Huatulco as being a place of great uh, trade. So again, we assume that they actually uh, did some trading with the people of Huatulco. A lot of it was actually contraband um, that they were uh, moving around um, through, through the Pacific coast of, of the uh, uh, Americas. Um, another interesting mention uh, for those indigenous products and industries is in the port of Chesapeake, which is today uh, Michoacan in Mexico. Um, they talk about um, um, things like cotton and cacao and indigo, which were uh, industries still under indigenous control <clears throat> and in the case of the Chontal people, um, we know for the 16th, 17th century that um, the Chontal people were um, masters of producing two uh, dyes, one um, called cochineal, which is made from uh, a parasite on, on cacti, it's a red dye, and one purple made from purpura uh, shell that you can see there on the bottom. Um, and in fact, the bottom shot is from archeological excavation in Huatulco. And um, these uh, colors exactly, the red and purple are the one represented on the uh, pirate ship in the Wamelula festivity, both in the sails and in their costume. Um, and we know in fact that the pirates uh, coveted these uh, dyes, especially cochineal. Cochineal was considered one of the uh, uh, most lucrative loot item after gold. So um, we can assume that um, the, the pirates were after, again, those Chontal industries. 
either they were uh, looting them for the purpose of loot um, or uh, for uh, purpose of trade. Now, uh, this is how the port of Atulco looks today. Um, in fact, uh, they still celebrate that uh, rich pirate history, as you can see, but it turned into a very touristic uh, port of trade uh, today. So there are those yachts that, that, that uh, you know, will come uh, from all over the world and they will talk about, you know, how Drake and Cavendish kind of looted um, um, the ports. Um, we took a, a more modest approach um, and what we uh, actually did is took uh, facsimiles of the hack atlas. This is uh, what you can see here that one of our field school students is holding is uh, the reproduction of the Huntington Library hack atlas. And what we're trying to do is actually try to uh, put ourselves in, in the shoes or in the boats of these early navigators, the, the, the English uh, or, or French or uh, uh, Spanish to navigators and try to uh, uh, look at the coast from their, their perspective. Uh, in this case, uh, Stephen uh, is trying to identify what is shown in the Hack Atlas um, as spots. They talk about spots here on the mountain um, that allow these uh, navigators to identify the entrance to uh, the port. You can see them uh, supposedly on the mountains. We were not able to, in fact, identify them, as you can see in this image, while we were sailing. But later on, we were talking with uh, other fishermen, and they told us that you can still see those spots on the mountain and then identify the entrance to the port. And recently, we've been playing around with Google Earth, and we think we actually identified that those set of mountains where there are bold uh, spots that I suppose you can see from uh, the mountains. So next season, we actually go back, we're going to go back with uh, this reproduction, the Clements Library reproduction. We didn't have it when we uh, went to the field last time in 2019. Um, and we'll try again, uh, again to see what those uh, pirates actually saw. Um, so, Going back to Guamelula or Guamelula as it is on the Hack Atlas uh, and the Chontal people, uh, what is fascinating in the Clements uh, Hack and other Hack Atlases that I looked at is that um, on, uh, on the Hack, Guamelula is described as port of Guamelula. Um, while in the Derotero and the Spanish uh, version, it actually uh, uh, annotated as a pueblo, as a town. Um, so this is in fact the only place in, uh, uh, in the hack or when you compare the hack and the Derotero where they translated or, or, or uh, changed the, the designation of a town into a port. And yet you can see that Juan is located inland, it's not on the coast. Um, this, this is also the situation today and it was in the past. So uh, another, uh, another difference is in the Derrotero, the coast is actually a playa, which is a coast, Playa del Obispo. Whereas in the hack, it's a bay. They didn't, uh, tr they didn't uh, uh, translate Playa's coast. Um, you would expect the Spanish to be Bahia del Obispo, but in fact, um, the Spanish change, the English changes into Bay, which indicates that the English probably considered this uh, uh, part of the coast and, and uh, Wamilula itself as somewhere where they can uh, uh, land their ships and um, um, actually go into the shore, either exchanging, again, trading with the Chantal people um, or, um, or attacking them. And in fact, in 1687, we have uh, uh, a record of uh, the French pirate uh, Pierre Picard, that's the other Captain Picard, the French pirate Picard attacking Wamelula. This is the only uh, description we actually have of a pirate attack over uh, Wamelula itself. Um, and uh, this is his uh, uh, historian, his chronicler, uh, Ravenu de Lausanne, who actually uh, wrote this book. And in 1687, uh, they're actually uh, uh, attacking and looting Wamelula. 
And note again that um, this uh, date is only a few years after Hack uh, started producing his uh, atlases. We don't know if they actually used those atlases, but again, that cartographic information um, was uh, obviously uh, spreading among other uh, crews and, and uh, ships. Um, and that's maybe they're attacking Wamilula because they uh, uh, knew that this is an area where they can interact with the uh, indigenous people. Um, in fact, we may have found some indigenous, uh, some sorry, archeological uh, evidence for that attack. I won't go into this right now, but there are ramparts and trenches on the road uh, to the village today. Uh, they were documented by an early archeological project. And another interesting case is the case of Astata, uh, just uh, southeast of Wamilula. This uh, is uh, notated in the uh, Hack Atlas as an Indian town uh, by the Rio of Estata. And um, the archeological survey, in fact, found a large archeological site right where the Hack Atlas is located today, uh, lo locates it, uh, sorry, in the 1680s. Um, nevertheless, uh, today, uh, the town of Astata has moved further inland and, and, and is uh, located just adjacent to Wamilula. And we know that this uh, shift, this move happened uh, in the late uh, 1600s. So um, this was probably another one of those settlement mobilities that happened as a result of those uh, pirates attacks. So um, to conclude, what we're, uh, trying to do is not just uh, reconstruct those complex entanglements between the indigenous, the pirates, and, and the enslaved Africa, which I really haven't touched on today, but also collaborate with the host communities, in this case, uh, Wamelula, the Chomtao indigenous people, uh, our collaborators there, and uh, share this information uh, as much as we gather the, the uh, information from their festivities, from their uh, historical record, uh, we we uh, uh, collaborate with them uh, in the formation of uh, collaborative space, either virtual or physical. We're thinking of bringing, for example, facsimile of the hack atlases into the next uh, to the next festivity, hopefully next year, uh, and and build a small exhibition in the village, and again bring that information back to uh, the people who history uh, it is actually. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. That was wonderful. Um, I am going to do just a couple of housekeeping announcements now. I'll remind everybody to put your questions in the Q&A section and we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, so, this year the Clements Library is pleased to support the um, the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission and the U of M History Department in hosting the annual Underground Railroad Heritage Gathering. This is a day long conference on Saturday, October 2nd on the U of M campus and you can find a link to um, and the registration in the chat. Coming up on our next bookworm on October 15th, Book Fairs 101, The Hunt and the Hype. I will be joined by Jay Platt and Garrett Scott, members of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America and instrumental to the success of the Antiquarian Book Fair, which is celebrating its 45th year. If you're in the area, I hope that we will see you at the book fair on Sunday, October 17th. Because you have already registered for the bookworm, you will receive a reminder about upcoming sessions. And if you're unable to attend live, you will receive uh, an email with the link to the recording. And in fact, we will send that follow-up email with resources mentioned during today's broadcast uh, later this afternoon. You can also view previous recordings and resources on our website. Once again, I would like to thank Tom Root for sponsoring today's episode of The Bookworm. 
And if you're interested in sponsoring a future episode, please contact me or Ann Bennington Helper. Thank you all so much for being a part of our Bookworm community through your participation in these webinars. Okay, did it stop the screen share? Hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Is the screen share gone? <clears throat> I'm having a little bit of trouble with, with what I'm viewing on my screen today. Okay. I, can, I can see you, Angela. I'm not sure there was a screen share um, that we've ah, seen any slides, but I can right. see you. Perfect. That, that is all good. We, we, that, that works too. Um, so let me see if I can get to the Q&A section. Why does it not want to pull up for me? Well, can you both see the Q&A section? Okay, so would you mind reading a question and answering it? Uh, I can start uh, with the first one. Um, Tom uh, Wagner has, uh, did the Hack Atlas benefit from the extensive ship logs of the thousands of whaling ships that traverse uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean after 1690. Um, I, uh, that's, that's a fascinating uh, question, especially in regards to uh, the Clements hack. Um, and in fact, um, as, uh, as I was reading this earlier, I pulled, um, I'll, I'll share my screen quickly again. Um, this is, I hope you can see that, this is uh, one of the pages of the Clements hack uh, which has uh, an interesting annotation here uh, from 1791. Um, so again, almost a hundred years after uh, this hack was uh, produced. Um, and uh, it's, it's very short as you can see, uh, but, uh, and I believe it's somewhere off the coast of, of Chile, um, but it actually, uh, um, there is a name there of the captain, it talks about Captain Ellis of the, uh, of the Stormont. And we, we actually have some information of that uh, whaling expedition. Uh, and in fact, about uh, Reuben Ellis, um, I tried to find some information about him. I think he was actually born in Newfoundland. Um, or no, sorry. Um, I think the ship came from Newfoundland. I'm not, I, can, I can't remember exactly, but um, th that's, um, I think maybe the only um, uh, use of the hack atlas is, as far as I know, um, in, um, in the 17th or in the 18th uh, century, uh, and that late, uh, maybe uh, Chet know of others, but this was a whaling expedition. And that kind of also brings the question whether the hack uh, atlases were originally uh, or later uh, taken ab aboard ships because obviously all that information would have been uh, of use to those uh, uh, navigators. So uh, this, is, at least as far as I'm, I'm concerned, it's not answered yet. Um, obviously, a lot of these, uh, as uh, Chet uh, was showing us, were gifts for nobility and, and rich patrons, but um, that information uh, obviously would have been uh, useful to um, those uh, navigators. So um, yeah, I hope that that kind of answers your, uh, your question. I'm not sure Chad has uh, anything to add there. Well, I'll just add that uh, uh, my reading was that the, the question was, did, did Hack benefit from the information contained in whaling logbooks? And uh, to, to my knowledge, no. So. <clears throat> Neither Danny nor I had time today to really compare in detail <clears throat> the, the maps in hack atlases and the maps in the Spanish derroteros. Um, but their their hacks maps are largely based on those in this captured Spanish derrotero. And uh, as as both 
Danny and I showed, there was new information added to the atlases, to hex atlases, uh, that, that doesn't come from the Spanish Deroteros, but I did, didn't see any evidence of information that, that would have come from a, a whaling logbook, for example. And Danny, perhaps you want to take the next question? So Liz Lewis asks, uh, were the English pirates sanctioned by the English government king? Um, again, pirates is you know, a very, very broad term. Uh, we use privateer, corsairs, and et cetera. There are other uh, uh, terms for that. And um, that really depended on the situation, uh, the, geopoli the geopolitics in Europe at the time. Um, if that specific or if England or a specific uh, other uh, maritime nation was fighting with Spain, um, then um, they were actually often sanctioned by uh, those governments to uh, loot and attack um, and, uh, and gather information spy for uh, the king or, or queens. Um, but oftentimes um, there were uh, maybe a peace treaty and then those uh, uh, pirates were outlawed, and then there were actually pirates. They were uh, actually doing it on their own accord, uh, oftentimes, and, and even uh, they were tried back in, in England um, if they did something bad. Um, so again, it depended on the, the geopolitical situation uh, back in Europe, and, and sometimes, strangely enough, that changed while those ships were uh, on voyage. So you know, and information they didn't have internet then. So they could have changed their status from privateers to looters to, to pirates as they were actually sailing. So that was an interesting situation as well. So maybe I'll make, make bold to take the next question from Cheryl, which is, uh, did Hack focus on the West Coast of the America, of America and the Gulf of Mexico, or did he also include the East Coast and other areas? So, <clears throat> the numerical majority of hack surviving atlases depict the, the Pacific coast of the Americas, uh, but there are two other atlases uh, he made that are devoted to the islands of Southeast Asia. One at the Library of Congress, uh, which has been digitized, and the other at the British Library. <clears throat> but. Uh, he made some individual maps that relate to the Atlantic coast of uh, the Americas, but but not a, a, an atlas of the nature, the same nature as his atlas of the uh, Pacific coast of the Americas. And I can read the, the next uh, comment by uh, Cheryl Thurber. My ancestor, Captain John Thurber, was active in the same time period of in the same period of time, 1660 to 1717. He is incorrect, uh, incorrectly listed in Wikipedia, combined with the pirate Captain John Churcher. They were from different places originally in England and in America. My ancestor was based in Bristol. Churcher was based in New York. Uh, Thurber did bring rice to South Carolina and was a merchant going uh, as far as China but the pirate inf info is about Churcher. Th that's very interesting. Um, in fact, um, there's a lot of uh, confused and confusing information uh, about at least, uh, I'm not that familiar with the Atlantic and Caribbean, but on the Pacific, who was actually there? Uh, I listed some names, uh, but I suspect there are others. And, and you know, if we dig in the archives, we'll find uh, you know, more names. Um, and um, especially if uh, I'm not sure which route um, Thurber took to China, um, but uh, he may have uh, passed through the coast, uh, through the Pacific uh, coast that I discussed today. Um, I haven't come, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't come across his uh, name yet, but uh, that's uh, definitely uh, a possibility. Um, Chad, do you have anything to add there? That's great. Um, moving forward, there's some, some kind words from uh, Mickey McGuire. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and then from Sandy Shapiro, uh, did the library of Fernando Colon 
influence the hack products. Um, so this is referring to Christopher Columbus's son who had one of the largest libraries in Europe. <clears throat> and to my knowledge, no, again, the, um, the hack atlases depend largely on the, the Spanish derrotero that was captured off the coast of Ecuador from the, the Spanish ship Rosario. Um, and whether maps from the library of Columbus's son might have influenced or provided source material to the Spanish derroteros, uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, my understanding is that <clears throat> although uh, much of the library of Columbus's son survives, not all the maps that are listed in the earliest catalogs of the library are now with the library. So, and, and no one has uh, been able to find those maps elsewhere and identify them as belonging to the library. So um, there's no way to be certain uh, that information from uh, that library did not influence uh, the Spanish derroteros that formed Hack's source, but uh, we don't have any evidence that they did in any case. And the next one is yours, Chet. Okay. Uh, did the sinking of the ship in 1644 as it carried treasures toward England have any impact on the outcome of the Civil War? that was raging in England at that time from uh, James Davis. Uh, I'm not sure that I haven't investigated that very curious detail, which doesn't appear in the other hack atlases uh, that I've examined. Uh, there, there is no mention of the fact that that treasure was being taken to, to England uh, to support the king. So that's a, a topic for additional research, but thank you for your question. I can take the next one. Um, sure. I would like to know which area of Africa or other parts in the world were the enslaved people taken to the area in Mexico in 17th century. I heard some of indigenous people had dark skin as well. Um, that's an interesting uh, uh, question and point. Um, the indigenous people, um, some of them did have uh, dark skin, but at least in New Spain, um, they were not enslaved or they were not considered slave, although you can argue that a lot of the conditions were basically uh, uh, slavery, but the enslaved Africans um, originally, uh, again, the 17th century, I believe they arrived from, from Western Africa, from Angola and places like that. Um, but uh, for our specific case, um, it's interesting that the, um, again, the encoded information, the festivity, the uh, negros, the black ones, uh, carry like what they call a passport. And um, they uh, claim that they arrived from a place called Montero in Jamaica. Um, and Montero sounds very close enough to Montego, Montego, or in Spanish, Montego Bay, um, which was, you know, under Spanish and, and then English control. Um, so, um, it is possible, in fact, that they're talking about uh, enslaved Africans that were actually uh, either uh, brought from the plantations in Jamaica or maybe abducted. Um, obviously, again, the, the English uh, based their, their wealth and trade on, on these enslaved people um, and brought them uh, with them on board ships. But again, in the case of this festivity, we actually see the, the, the black people um, clashing and, 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 and fighting with the pirates, which again, we're not sure exactly what to make of, but that could be actually indication of those enslaved people brought by the Spanish, mostly from the port of Veracruz, from the Atlantic side, um, and who actually lived and settled um, uh, on the Pacific coast as well. Um, so we're not exactly sure again, who are those uh, negros that are representing the festivity, but that's an interesting question. And then the, the final question is, uh, how long was the voyage from Europe to the Pacific coast of Mexico? Um, I don't have a number for that in terms of uh, days of, of sailing offhand. Uh, Danny, perhaps you do? Um, I, I don't, and um, 
I only, um, maybe someone else in the audience know, but um, at least for these so-called pirates, there are two options, either uh, go, you know, off the, uh, uh, off the tip there uh, and, and uh, the Cape Horn and, and actually go from the Atlantic into the Pacific there in Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and this is kind of the last point that you see in most hack atlases um, where that passage was. Obviously it was of great interest to those navigators. Um, but uh, another option was actually crossing through Panama, which is kind of the narrowest um, point there in, in Central America. Um, they would, um, they would uh, uh, land on the Atlantic side um, and um, actually, uh, um, well, they will either, I, I read somewhere they're actually taking apart some ships and, and rebuilding them on the Pacific side, but often they're actually building new ships on the Pacific side. But uh, the interesting uh, aspect of it, uh, at least uh, for my purposes, is that uh, in order to make that crossing uh, into the Pacific, which I also don't know how long it took them on land, um, they often relied on indigenous groups that were hostile to the Spanish because obviously they were crossing through Spanish territory at the time. Um, so they relied on these uh, uh, indigenous groups hostile to the Spanish in order to show them the route and uh, help them obviously with building uh, those ships again on the Pacific side. So I'm not sure exactly uh, the day, but I guess, again, it depends obviously on the conditions and on the route that they took. So the next question is from Barbara Prince. Uh, do you know if most ships have been resurrected and all treasures claimed? Um, I know I, I, that's a, a part of the investigation that I haven't pursued completely. I know that uh, two of the ships have in fact been, uh, been excavated uh, in modern times, uh, but I have not gone through all of the, the shipwrecks uh, let's say I haven't gone through all of shipwrecks indicated and in hacked to see if they have all been excavated in modern times, nor have I specifically focused on the ones that do have treasure. But uh, two of the shipwrecks that Hack identifies as having treasure on them were in fact excavated in modern times. But um, I, I think uh, Barbara Prince is alluding in part to the, the question of uh, the, the legal rights to uh, what is on those shipwrecks, which is uh, a very tangled issue. Um, and there are ongoing uh, lawsuits relating to uh, the recovery of, or, or even lawsuits preceding the actual excavation of shipwrecks as to who will uh, own the, the artifacts that are recovered. And um, there is a comment by Mickey McGuire relating to the earlier uh, question. Uh, the travels from Africa could take from months and in some cases years, depending on the prevailing uh, winds. Um, so yeah, um, obviously, uh, definitely, uh, I, I can see how it will take uh, months, years. I, I assume you're going around the world if you're uh, taking that much time. I do know that uh, at least, um, for the Pacific side, uh, the Manila Galleon uh, between Manila and the Philippines and Acapulco in Mexico would have taken about four months. Um, and it was pretty predictable. The, the currents and the winds uh, were pretty predictable. They did that voyage twice a year. Um, so the ship would go again from one end to the other and then they will reload, we trade and, and, and go back uh, again, not necessarily the same ship, but um, that was the length of time from uh, Manila to Acapulco. Um, but yeah. And I'm not sure the next question, I think Chet, you probably know better. So Mark Jenkins asked, uh, what were the pages of the Atlas made from? And their, their paper uh, is not parchment. And I don't know, in, in the case of printed books, uh, sometimes uh, a few copies are printed on parchment and then the rest on paper. And those few copies are, are special 
uh, gifts to patrons, <clears throat> for example, but uh, I don't think in any of the hack atlases are on parchment, at least not to my knowledge. Well, thank you both so much. And I'm sorry about my uh, screen troubles. Um, and thank you to everybody who asked such great questions. I know that, um, you know, this conversation, it, I, I feel like later we'll all be thinking of more things that we're, that we're wondering about because it's, it's been really a great conversation about all the layers of the Hack Atlas. Uh, so with that, thank you once again for your wonderful presentations. Thank you for hosting and organizing. You're Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for everyone who attended as well. And send everyone on their way. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you. You too. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.